Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So we're going to start with a little bit of one of my favorite philosophers. Life is like a movie, write your own ending, keep believing, keep pretending. Um, I have a thing for Kermit the Frog. Um, and yes, I realize it's probably a bit weird to get your life philosophy from a stuffed frog, but we're going to roll with it. This was actually my high school quote, and the fact that it's, I still believe it is a little bizarre, but it's the write your own ending part that I really want to talk about tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from New York. I have been out here for a long time. I came out here for school and never went back. Um, my career has been a little bit all over the place, but I certainly wouldn't have it any other way. So I went from being a designer at Pottery Barn. I started a toy company, which Emily mentioned, designing toys for kids with special needs. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I worked for a company that where we did product lines, everything from initial concept all the way through finished products. Um, and I started up with creative division and design division for them. And we did everything from travel products to adventure products. If you guys know Bear Grylls, I designed all his camping gear for him. So random things like that. Um, meanwhile, I, I was teaching Stanford undergrad, uh, basic product design and mechanical engineering. So I did that for about seven years. And now I teach at the D school in the executive education. So I teach design strategy there. And most recently, I just finished four years at Capital One, where I started three individual design practices. And that's really where I'm going to focus tonight. Before I move on to actually what I'm supposed to talk about, I'm take a little tangent here and talk to you a little bit about what drives me as a designer. So I really believe that design is the great equalizer, and it is our responsibility as designers to create that equity. So I don't think that um, accessibility is a medical problem, and I think that's how we categorize it. I think it's a design problem, and I think as designers, we create services, products, whatever, and consciously or unconsciously, we are giving people access to participate in society through that. Our design system is, or education teaches us to design for healthy 25, 30 year olds, whatever, um, like us who probably speak English and you know have a certain level of cognitive skills. That is not the full spectrum of people that are out there. So if you take anything away from my talk tonight, um, even though most of it is not actually about this, please take it seriously that as designers, you are really changing people's lives for the better or for the worse, and be careful about what you do because it is our responsibility. So, okay, random tangent over. <laughs> but one of the, so this was the toy company that I started, Development by Design, and sort of that, what I just talked about, it was a major piece of this. So I really believe in universal design, and if you design for the extremes, it's better for everybody. So I had no desire to do a startup. I remember them asking us during school, how many of you guys want to do a startup one day? I was one of three people that was like, hell no, why would anybody want to do that? Um, but I remember talking to parents who walked down every single aisle at Toys R Us and would leave empty handed. Play is how children learn, it's how they build skills, and if they have no access to play, they have no opportunity to learn. So there was this big need, I saw the cause, I saw the major thing that needed to happen in the world, and so I figured if nobody else was doing it, it was my responsibility to go do it. So I started a toy company, won't go off on too long about that, because these are pretty short talks, uh, but it was called Development by Design. But what I really want to talk to you about today is what I did at Capital One. So at Capital One, I started three different practices, as Emily mentioned, in four years. So I started, I was recruited there to do start up a design thinking practice for the card line of business, which was the biggest uh, sort of group at Capital One. It's about 85% of the company. And so figure out how to implement design strategy into that. So that was why I went. Um, then after that, I left that team and decided to start a physical experience design team, which considering the theme of tonight is where I'm going to focus this. Um, and then I actually also helped launch a data visualization practice. I left Capital One about a month ago. I'm not sure if I mentioned that part. <laughs> so we'll get to that. what's next in a minute. Um, so why did I start a physical design practice at a bank? Uh, well, there were a number of reasons. But here's the number one. I had no, this was sort of like the toy company. This wasn't an intentional, like, I'm going to go start this practice. It was nothing like that. It was more of a, here's what needed to happen. So this is, a, some, is something that um, someone that was on my team, Jess Lamb, lovely, lovely designer, did a while ago. You can see it says 2015 here. And so this was sort of the motivation for it. This is what she called the love logic chart, OK? And up here you have logic. Up here, you ha down here, you have love. Pretty simple. Things like banks or utilities or your dentist, things like that fall on the logic spectrum here. So assuming you've, you're doing it well, you're pretty high on the logic side, right? 
Um, not so far on the love side, right? Like if you ask me who my dentist is, I will give you his name and tell you he's great, cool. But I'm not gonna like be talking about it for no reason at all, right? That's just not what you do. The love side is where you hit sort of, you sort of have a little bit more of that in. So in honor of Jess Lamb, I'm gonna use her example. She loved Taco Bell, like loved Taco Bell. Like she would admit she's fully in that crazy zone about Taco Bell. And she will tell you about Taco Bell whether you want to hear it or not. But when you're on that love chart over here, it's when you're really pushing out the information and telling people about it, not waiting for it to be solicited from you. And so her point was, if you wanna take something like a bank who's up here and get people talking about it and promoting it for you, you gotta sort of move it over a little bit on that love axis. I mean, don't screw up your logic, but you know, move it a little bit over. So I was like, okay, that makes sense to me. I like this, this is good logic. And we really wanna up this emotional connection and really figure out how to connect more with our customers, with associates, you know, all these things. So that seemed like good motivation. So how was I gonna do that? All right, so here comes the next side. Okay, we already did Kermit, now we're on to Mickey. Roll with it. Um, as a kid, you read a Disney book and it's good. You see a Disney movie and it's awesome. You go to Disney World and your little five-year-old brain explodes that emotional connection is something that only happens in real life. It's something that, at least not very often, you get through a digital encounter. Now, I was working in a bank that was having a digital transformation. We were hiring 450 UX and UI designers, and I was like, hi, I wanna do physical stuff, and they all thought I was crazy. Luckily, at the time, another team had just exploded, um, and some people were sort of left in the ruins, and a couple of those were actual makers, like made physical things, mechanical engineers, industrial designers, and no one had any clue what to do with them. So I was like, yes, I want them, they're mine, I got them, Take, bring them over here. So I decided to turn this into a team. They were depressed, they hated Capital One, they hated design, they hated everything to do with everything. I was the fifth leader thrown at them in a month, so they hated me. And I showed up and I was like, hi, my first day, three people told me they'd already given notice and I was like, no worries, I got this. <laughs> All right, so we're in an awesome situation right now and I was like, okay, how do we build something from nothing? And how do you convince people to do something crazy that the entire business is telling you is totally nuts? So that's sort of what I wanna talk about. <laughs> so I had three major steps to that. Rallying a cause, creating a culture of trust and having faith in the process. All right. So let's start with rallying a cause. To me, it's really about rallying a cause or a need. It's not about a goal. A goal is a task. It's meeting a sales number. That's not motivating. That's not getting you out of bed, especially if you're a designer. That's not what we do. We go towards a bigger vision than that. So really, how do you create those things? Oops, well, I wasn't supposed to go that far yet. So for us, it was definitely create that emotional connection that I was just talking about. Okay, that was number one. And then the other one, which was a more internal one to our team, was prove that we belonged here because no one thought we belonged in a bank, and certainly a bank that thinks it's a tech company. So people were kind of like, why are you here? What are you doing? And what are you, like, this is insane. And so tr proving that out was the other part of it. The other part of the cause came at the project level. So that's more at the team level, at the project level. So we were a bank trying to pretend that we were, and this is still the beginning, we've sort of made it a little further by now, uh, trying to be a tech company. So Capital One sees its peers at all the, as all the big tech companies in Silicon Valley, not as Bank of America or Wells Fargo. Um, 2017, when, we, when I sort of started this team, that was still like a crazy concept. So how do you start changing people's perspective? So we went to South by Southwest, and we're like, great, we're Capital One House. Why would anybody with all the crazy stuff that goes on at South by Southwest want to come to Capital One House? How do we bring them in the door? So that was our job. So what we created was something that would really shift people's perspective. So if you look at the top image here, uh, what we did was we ended up creating a mural, like a hand-painted mural. Nothing digital, it wasn't a screen, it was just a mural. But as you started playing with it and touching it and interacting with it, it came to life and it animated. And it made people do a double take and it made people come in off the street and it made people want to touch it because it wasn't like a touch screen that you see every day. It really shifted this perspective of what people were doing. And so this was a day in the life Austin scene, but as you touch different things, it told you about different things at Capital One and then crazy other Easter eggs popped up and some other fun stuff happened. And as you went upstairs into our event, we had a data visualization on the wall. You can see sort of these big giant buttons that we installed and stuff. 
but uh, that talked about how people engage, and it was very much about community and how um, the diversity of people in our community actually makes us better and stronger and prettier, and the lights that you see on the top change color based on it and stuff like that, and it was 2017, so I'm not gonna comment on whether it was a complete political statement by us, uh, my team, not all of Capital One, but we were all like, let's promote community and diversity. So that's what this one was for us. Um, another one that we did was, so Capital One acquired Adaptive Path. I don't know if, has anybody been to any of the Adaptive Path design events? Oh, one, yes, okay. Um, so one of them was LX, which was the Leading Experiences Conference. And so we had a whole bunch of design leadership there. A week before the conference, the heads of the events came to me and she was like, we need to figure out how to get people to actually talk to each other because people tend to just be in their own spaces during these events, and we really don't want that to be the case. So with a week and no money, um, we decided to come up, we, we were like, okay, well, how do we sort of create what we were calling a, min a mingle inducer, term we made up. So but what we did is we did something very simple. We put a big si sign in the main lobby that said, what kind of leader are you? Pick two. And we put these, this display out that had these rings. And so every leader had to pick what their two major leadership qualities were that they valued the most. Everybody did it. Everybody put on the rings. And for the next few days of the event, they wore the rings around. And it became the best icebreaker. Because you could talk to anybody about what kind of leader they were and see, oh, you got the visionary? And, oh, you thought positive was, you know, whatever it was. And it created connections that never would have been created in other ways. So again, this was not something that we did because we were like, we need something big and shiny to show. This was like $400 in four days of, of you know, on a laser cutter during a blackout, which was a little complicated. But, um, and it was all about how to create that, solve that for that need. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is building a culture of uh, trust and collaboration and support and not egos. So I've been talking to you about this amazing team. Figured I should show you who they were. These, this is the team. Some of these were the sort of depressed designers that started out um, miserable when I got there. Now we're the happiest people. Um, and some of them are, most of them are the people, people that I hired along the way. But this team is a powerhouse. They are the most amazing designers. And part, a lot of that is because they are incredibly talented. But a lot of that is because of the collaboration and the way they work together. They are the team that every other designer at Capital One wants to join. And frankly, a lot of non-designers as well. All right, so why? Okay, well, it's all about the people. So there are some major pieces to that that I wanna really talk about. One is the diversity of superpowers, okay? Every one of them has a completely different skill set. We have an architect, we have a sculptor, we have a couple industrial designers, mechanical engineers, product designers, all over the place. And because of that, they are all constantly learning from each other and bringing in their diverse point of views and not competing with each other. And that's a pretty beautiful thing. Okay, the second thing I wanna talk about is integrity, capacity, and motivation. An old boss of mine once told me always, this was like 15 years ago, always hire for integrity, capacity, and motivation. Skills can be learned, no problem. If people have those things, they're going to make themselves um, unbelievably useful. And he could not have been more right. Um, so every one of them had those things in spades. We created a culture where whole people were welcome to come. Like people brought them or their their whole selves. They, when people had bad things going on at home, we made it life first, and then work followed. Okay, but if you have good, if people come first, the good work will follow. So if people were going through hard times, we supported them. If people were going through good times, we celebrated it. People, this group went, goes to lunch together all the time. This is a group of people that really truly care about each other as human beings, not just as colleagues. And frankly, now that I'm not a Capital One, that's the part that I miss. Um, transparency and honesty. So this is amongst the group, but also as a leader on the team. So the title of my talk is Designing into the Unknown. Okay, we were creating something that doesn't exist. I didn't know where it was going. I, I mean, if I, I didn't know. And I had, as a leader, be okay with saying, guys, I have no idea what we're gonna turn this into. And that had to be okay. But because of that transparency and me not trying to fake it and be like, well, this is what we're gonna do and it's gonna be where this is where we're gonna land in three years, it became a communal thing. It became like, yes, I was setting the vision, but I was doing it with all of our vision incorporated into that. It was for all of us that we, and we were doing it together. It also became something where they knew that the, tra the transparency and honesty for myself and from the other leaders 
was so strong that we also, they also knew that we had their back through anything. So in our three years as a team, we, had, we were under four different VPs. That's a lot of org change that happened. And every time an org change happens, everybody freaks out and everyone's all you know, up in arms and finally by the time they settle down, their next org change happens, right? And that's just how it works in corporate world. This team never even blinked an eye. They're like, okay, cool, and went on with their day. Like, nothing. And that was because they had faith in me and the other leaders. And that is a huge thing. Like, shit is gonna change. Like, nothing is gonna be stable. So if you are, take your comfort and stability, make sure you're having faith in the things, or putting your, that faith in the things that are going to stay stable, not the things that in a big corporate environment just aren't. Um, Okay, and on the project level, what does that look like? So I was talking to the head of the Capital One Pro Bono uh, group at some point, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, two years ago, and I was like, hey, I wanna do something to inspire myself a little bit, and we started talking about the UCSF Children's Hospital, the new one over in Mission Bay, and how their fifth floor playground is just sad and needs a little bit of love. And so I went back to my team and I was like, you know guys, I'm gonna start working on this thing. I know you guys are overloaded, not a team project, like don't feel like you need to jump in, but if you want to, come on over. Unanimous, hell yeah, we're in. They all came over. This was not the design thinking team. I also started one of those, but this became a huge design thinking project. This wasn't like a, hey, go design this physical thing right now. This was new to this team. They didn't know a lot of this stuff beforehand, but we did workshops. We worked with kids who were in the hospital. We worked with siblings. We worked with parents. We worked with staff. We did these huge workshops and we co-designed this entire playground. Um, I won't go into too much detail. If you want to know more about where that project is, there is an article uh, that I can show you about that. Um, or tell you about more later. But the whole point is that this was a project that was completely outside everybody's comfort zone, but because of this camaraderie and the faith in the team, there was no hesitation or fear from anybody and everyone just jumped in. Okay, the last thing, the last one I wanna talk about is having faith in the design process. Be nimble and pivot optimistically. Because if you know where you're gonna end up at the beginning, probably not doing it right. So we are taught as a society to do this to know where the destination, like know what the answer is before you even start, right? You wanna write a business plan, here's the answer to get there. You wanna become a partner in your law firm, you know, this is your path to do that. I don't do that, okay? What I do is a little bit more like this. And that's amazing. There's no f known destination when you start, and it's terrifying. But you have to just follow the process, and if you ha I, the, but the beauty and the creativity comes out of not knowing where you're going to land, and by going in all these different directions and not having that predetermined destination from the start, and that's where I feel you're going to get the most beautiful, amazing design changes, and that's what I think it's like to think like a designer. That's also why I think designers are the most suited to solve these big, messy problems where the destinations aren't known from the beginning, and why I think that is one of the things designers should take on. More. Okay, so one of the things I've learned in my time at Capital One, let's just sort of recap a little bit of that. One, culture shifts and getting people to think differently, like, hey, physical experience design really does belong in a bank. Design thinking, great way to do this. Um, a really fun, really fun challenge. Not easy, but a really fun challenge. Um, number two, it's all about the people. Make sure you're on a good team with good people because really that's what it's about at the end of the day. The design process works, follow the craziest, don't follow the direct path. My last one is, if you're, if you're getting too comfortable, it's probably go, time to go jump off your next cliff and try something new. Start that new team, do that new job, because if, if you're too comfortable, you're not learning. And it's always good to write your own ending, as Kermit would say, so make it yours, because it's gonna be far more adventurous and far more exciting than the predetermined path. So with that, um, I am off to my next adventure because as I said, I, meant I left Capital One about a month ago. So I'm about to go scare myself a little bit, or a lot, I guess I should say, <laughs> right now. So my next adventure, which is just kicking off, is with two partners of mine who are amazing. Um, we have gotten a grant from the Gates Foundation to go implement human-centered design um, in service of increasing childhood immunization around the world. So we'll be working with organizations like PATH and UNICEF to uh, work in Africa and Myanmar and a few other places to help increase the childhood immunization, childhood immunization rates. So don't know where that's gonna lead. Hopefully Emily and Joe will have me back in a year or so to give you that adventure, but that's all.
thank you for listening.